What's going on, y'all? Machiavelli Mills TV. So, you know, I've been a media junkie since I was a kid. I was always watching TV, always into TV shows like that were kind of ahead of my age group since I was young. I liked TV. I liked watching uh, different type of issues be handled in friendships, relationships, um, in school situations, all of those things. One of the shows that I, you know, started, I watched as a kid um, with my sister and with my mom was Girlfriends, right? I remember, you know, watching the show with my mom. Then I had an older sister from my father. I would go to my father's house and I would watch it with her at times, too. Um, you know, watching this show, it, it's a comfort show for me because it, it's nostalgic. It takes me back to those times when I was a young boy and I would come in from playing basketball or come in from, you know, being at my boy, playing a video game, my homeboy and them. And then I come in there with my mom or my sister and I'm watching what they watching. Right. But I can never I, I like giving black creators the credit they deserve, giving black creators their flowers. Mara Brock Akil's work on Girlfriends is exemplary. That show is a tremendous show. The way she wrote the the black woman and how the the many nuances of the black woman with it is absolutely brilliant it was brilliant that's why that show ran for so long i think the show ran for eight seasons i believe eight or nine see i think eight seasons right um the way she broke like wrote these characters was it, it was phenomenal and i think i didn't really realize it till i got older right you see the 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 working class black woman who is the ultimate professional she is the cream of the crop. She's a lawyer. I'm talking about Joan. Um, you know, she's super successful in her career, but her love life is in shambles. It's topsy-turvy. She's trying to find love, trying to find love, trying to find it in any way possible. But she also is the, the, uh, the mother figure of her friend group, right? Always helping her friends solve their problems, letting her friend Lynn live with her for so long, um, Helping all of her friends through all these different issues, but at the same time, needing to be healed in a lot of different ways as she's seeing her friends progress and, and reach milestones that she always wanted for herself. She struggles with she struggles with not coming off as jealous while also trying to be supportive, but in her heart aching for the things that her friends has uh, and her friends have. And you see it create tension at times within her friendship dynamic but it's also very real because there's a lot of women and black women in corporate america who have found love but a lot of them they don't they're still struggling even though they have done everything right on paper they went to school got all these degrees they, have, they don't have any children they're not married and they want these things these aren't women who don't want it and you know they're seeing their other friends have it and they're trying to figure out how to cope with it we see Maya Wilkes. Maya was a, uh, she didn't get the degree, right? She was a teenage mother. She's married. On paper, really, she's the one in the show with the, the, the deepest religious and moral convictions of the friend group, right? Um, she from the hood, but, you know, she's still trying to climb up the economic ladder. She's an assistant. Or she used to be an assistant to Joan. Um, she's a, as a, as a housewife, she's an author and she's married something that Joan really probably wants to have, but she doesn't, but Maya doesn't have the, the financial uh, success, the career success that Joan has, you know what I mean? And then you see her struggling within a marriage. She's been married. She's been with the guy, her husband Darnell, since she was like 17 years old and you know, because they've been together so long, they, you know, they have times when their marriage gets on the rocks. Uh, her husband, she has an over, a overbearing husband, a guy who um, is at times rude to her friends. You, he, he is a, he is a my way or the highway type of husband. Um, at times, he holds, he holds Maya back from going back to school, from going back to school. I remember he got mad at her for buying like a three hundred dollar dress at times. I feel like at times her husband felt emasculated by her trying to thrive. He felt insecure about it by her trying to thrive and achieve more. And that is a reality for a lot of different women who are in the dating realm. You know what I mean? And even I, I, I remember uh, Maya 
as, as her son is growing up, she starts to project her experience as a teenage mother on her son's girlfriends, right? Calling his girlfriends fast and all that type of stuff, right? Which was probably something that she was called as a kid when she had a baby as a teenager. You know what I mean? So, yeah, it just talks about the, the teenage mom, the hustling mom that go out and get it. And still, she's married and has the life that some people professionally think they would love to have. But then she has her troubles. And she's also not as professionally successful as her other friends. Then you got you wrote the character of Lynn. Lynn, who is a biracial woman. She's mixed, half black, half white. But then she was adopted by a white family. You see, Lynn came into her blackness during her college years. Uh, she has all these postgraduate degrees. She's very, very smart. But then she has a problem with leeching off of her friends, staying and living with them, trying to find her way in life, trying to find out what her calling is. Uh, she has no relationship with her biological parents. Uh, I don't think she did. She tried to seek out her father. Um... And, and all those type of things after dating a guy who has <laughs> similarities to her to the point that her friend group was calling her friend, her her boyfriend, um, her brother, right? We see her and her um, her adoptive sister. She be she because she grew up with a white family. She grew up white, and she came into her blackness in college. I remember the episode where her uh, adoptive sister is singing um, Izzo. Jay-Z, H to the is O, V to the is A. She dropped the N-word. Now her, her her sister, like, hold on. You was a white girl a few years ago before you went to college. Then you got to, you went to college. You come and came into your blackness. You became biracial. Then you get into the black stuff. So what's the difference now? You see a black woman who is biracial, adopted by a white family, trying to navigate, trying to navigate her blackness, coming into her blackness. And then still trying to figure out her lane within the professional world. She's very smart, very educated, has friends who are successful. But she's trying to figure out where she belongs. And it also is rooted in her not knowing where she kind of comes from with her family but with being adopted. And I just thought, man, this is a brilliant, this show was so phenomenal to me. Then you got Tony Childs. Who is the girl who was looked at as the who not looked at? She's the most materialistic friend out of, of them all, right? She's successful, you know, college graduate, all of that, but she's shallow. She's popular, but shallow. Uh, even to the point where she marries uh, what's the guy named Todd, and was really marrying Todd based off what he had financially. They're married. Their marriage gets on the rocks, all of that. And I remember even she's about to get married. Joan struggling with the fact that Tony. The person who they feel like is the most materialistic, the person who they feel like is the most shallow, she's getting married and Joan is not. And Joan is, for the most, all of these women on the show had their issues and they were, um, yeah, they, they were broken in certain different ways in different areas. But we see uh, Joan like, yo, she's the most, for the most part, at times can be the most endearing at, at times, at times she can be a a bitch too at times, right? For, I, for lack of better words, I'm sorry for using that word. But yeah, um, she's struggling with the fact that she can't find love and a materialistic woman like Tony can do so. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, and then, and then even the, the, the black bourgeoisie, that's what uh, Tony represents, the bougie black girl. Even to the point where she snark about Jabari's name, calling him everything but his name. Jungle, <laughs> Jingle Jam, Jungle Jim, Jim Bari, uh, Jingle Jangle, <laughs> calling him Jumanji, every other name but Jabari. And I'm like, yeah, that's rude as hell. But, you know, um, she's a girl who wants to find her things in life and has no qualms. She has no, uh, she doesn't feel bad about wanting a, a guy with a lot of money, which is... <laughs> kind of represents the city girls of today, except that Tony was a professional in her own right, right? Um, then we got, well, I talked about how they wrote black women, but you got the, the friend, William Dent, who works there, close male friend and senior partner at the law firm where Joan works. And you see their relationship, all of that. But I, I really wanted to focus on the women of the show. And yeah, man, the way she wrote these different characters, I just thought it was brilliant. The way they were able to tackle different topics, like um, uh, Joan 
trying to date a man with his, who was a former sex addict and he all them different women he slept with and then you know the uh who had hiv in the show and they were all scared and jumping back when they found out uh, the girl had hiv when she cut herself on a knife um yeah then you see a woman even even maya right the episodes where she's having an affair with stan and you see that first of all i'm gonna say this it all leads back to Joan struggling for happiness and trying to find her love. Maya was supposed to be introducing Joan to Stan for Joan to date. She ends up intervening and, and talking to him, even though she's married and Joan and Stan were both single. Joan, uh, Stan ended up stalking her and all of that because he's so in love with her. And it's like, yo, you wasn't even supposed to be dealing with dudes. You were supposed to be letting dude meet your friend. You know what I mean? And, and and this whole thing leads to tension between Darnell, her, uh, Maya's husband, and Joan. And it just reminds me of certain, like, the nuances of relationships. When a girl is doing something she ain't supposed to do, her friends get involved to cover for her, which leads her, to, which, which puts her, uh, the other friend, at odds with their friend's husband for no reason, no to no fault of their own. But they're trying to cover for their homegirl. Uh, Stan bought the watch for her. Joan had to make it seem like she bought the watch for her. And it led to him thinking like, oh, you trying to up one up me? You trying to shove out things for my wife that uh, that I can't buy, which is making me look bad. Darnell felt threatened by that. Then we see, yeah, we see the divorce because of affairs. All of these different things, man. And I think that, you know, the, the show was golden. Mar Brock and Kill's work. It's phenomenal. I, as a, as I gotten older, I've rewatched Girlfriends at certain episodes at times. Not the whole series. I've rewatched certain episodes and stuff like that, and, and watching it with my son's mother and stuff like that, right? Um, and watching it with my uh, my mom as well. You like, yo, this show is written so well. These episodes are key, and her pen game is phenomenal. You know. Um, yeah, man, it just, I was like, yo, this show is really, really great. This is probably one of the great, greatest shows ever created. Not just one of the greatest black shows. One of the greatest shows ever created. Because nobody's life is perfect out of all, all of these women. They all have trials and tribulations, even though to one other friend, yeah, their life might be perfect to, the per to, the, to another person. you got the perfect life. You're married. you got a son. Oh, well, I don't, I'm not rich. Well, you got the perfect life, Joan. You you making great money, great career, beautiful home, nice car. You know you you're thriving, always doing better, doing great things. And then Joan says, "Well, I'm not married. I don't have a family." Then we go to Lynn. Lynn, she is beautiful girl, uh, smart beyond measure, living her life freely, um, and, and enjoying it thoroughly. But Lynn, like, hey man, I don't know where my I don't know where my place in life is. I'm I'm still trying to figure this out. Uh, Tony, Tony, you're a beautiful girl. You're married. You got you got a, married a, a doctor. Was was Todd? I think Doc, Todd was a doctor. I believe was Todd a doctor. I think I'm trying to think. Todd was a doctor, man. Todd was a doctor. Let me see. What was Todd? Todd, yeah, Todd, Doctor Todd Garrett. Todd was a doctor. And she like, you know, um, they still having problems in their marriage. Tony really only married him. She had a problem with his height and all of that. <laughs> we, see, we see the superficial woman, man. They only care about what the height is and how much, how tall he is, what type of money he got. And she not as happy as she really want to be. And Todd isn't as happy as he wants to be in their marriage. So, man, th th that shit is real life. It's real life for a lot of people for and, and for a lot of black women. And you writing black women in a way where... You're not villainizing them. You're not making them angels. You're making them human, which is dope for Mar Brock Akil.